Hi everyone and welcome to the film discussion of Aguntak, this week's film. Um, yeah, you notice the lack of participants here with me. That's because we had some technical issues and I forgot up the recording of our session. So most of that footage is not usable, but I will try my best to post whatever parts of it I can. But besides that, I am here alone and I'll make sure this doesn't happen again, I promise. But let's go ahead and discuss this beautiful film. So Aguntak um, is a masterpiece by a master, honestly. Satyajit Ray, the, the master of Indian cinema. And I do not know a man with a more diverse talent pool, a more varied set of interests and talent. And I think it's very fair to say that this being um, his last film he ever made, that Satyajit Ray, he left this behind for the world to know who he really was. So there's an interesting quote, it, um, and Mr. Ray is quoted to be saying, as soon as the last scene of this movie was filmed, he says, um, I have nothing more to say. I'm done. And he actually passes away two weeks later in hospital. So in this film, the character of Mr. Manmohan, uh, Manmohan Mitter, the Aganta called the uncle, um, the stranger rather, I think he personifies a lot of Mr. Ray. I think Mr. Ray poured his ideologies, his philosophy, his outlook on to, outlook to life into this character. And Utpal Dutt outdoes himself. And he like like we talked about Anand, how that was that was one role that Rajesh Kanna is synonymous with, you know, and no one else could play that character like Rajesh Kanna did because he was meant for the role. Similarly, Utpal Dutt as Manmohan Mishra. What more can be said? What beautiful acting, the emotion, the, the facial cues. And I think he really, really put into film what Mr. Ray was feeling at that time. And I don't, I've hardly seen a, a, a performance like this. He has equal amounts of mystique equal amount of um, humor. He's a very humorous person. His witty jokes and an equal amount of sophistication. And I think more than sophistication, depth of character is something we can use to describe Mr. Mitra. So without, without further ado, let's go on with the film. A story of a stranger, a story of a guest uninvited into a typical Bengali home, an air of suspicion in the family, doubting his every move. As much as they fall in love with him, they are unable to really connect with him because of his idiosyncrasy, because of his strangeness, and and because of their continuous pursuit of ulterior motive. Rather, their, a continuous pursuit of his ulterior motive or his, the assumed ulterior motive. So a random letter out of the blue from a relative presumed dead or at least missing for the last 35 years. How would we react if we received a telegram, an email out of the blue in today's day? Would we be welcoming? Would we be suspicious? Or would we just dismiss it? A common internet swindler, a scamster, a con man? Probably the same things that went in their head. If I receive a random me e an email or maybe a text message saying that, hey, I'm an uncle and I want to come to meet you, 
I block the contact. That's just the day, the age we live in. But even back in 1991, there was al already an air of the nuclear family. You know, they were very close as a family, but they were still nuclear. There was no village to raise the kids, if you know what I mean. There was no sense of larger community. It isn't to the extent of, there, there isn't that individuality we have today where each individual unto himself. But back then it was still, they still had a very powerful family dynamic and a powerful dynamic as a couple, a powerful sense of togetherness. But it wasn't the same as when Mr. Mitra was a kid. The whole tradition of being welcoming and basically Atiti Devo Baba, accepting a guest no matter where and who, where they're from and who they are, that was already being weeded out of society. Whether it was evil or not, we can never be sure because those days are past. But I think it's fair to say that most of us would have reacted similarly with an air of suspicion. I don't know how many of us would find it in our hearts to be accepting of the stranger. Yet, they did accept him. They did grow to love him. They did serve him. They did treat him like a guest, like a part of the family, or at least with suspicion, yes, but with a clear air of respect and honor. And I think that is something very beautiful in, um, in the movie and in the dynamic of the, the family, especially Sudhineva, especially her, despite all her doubts and despite all her suspicion, she still finds it her responsibility as a homemaker to accept the guest and to honor him and to serve him. And I love the way he got to know the family. He integrated himself into the family and how he was a charming gentleman. He never gave anybody an extra opportunity to doubt him. He, he, uh, he basically had, had all the traits of a perfect Bangla gentleman. He loved the food. He spoke beautiful language. And he even felt so much part of the family that he told her, hey, please keep the meat for night. We will enjoy this and we can have that later. He's already feeling part of the household. Probably because some part of him missed his family. Some part of him actually wanted that family back. And we can progress into him as a person, his ideology, his outlook to life, wanderlust. Some people love their homeland, their home, their family, their loved ones. And they wouldn't trade that for anything. They love that their society and their family are the center of their lives and they build their lives around the people they love. Yet others feel like their homeland, their home, their village, their family are like vines choking at them. They want to be free. They don't want to be a bird in a cage or a toad in a pond. They want to be free. They want to be part of the larger world. And I think this is perfectly, perfectly summed up in the analogy of the bison. He was in art college. He was learning art. He was an artist. But when he saw that bison in that foreign journal or foreign magazine, he said that no matter what art I learn, no matter how much I study in this college, I will never be able to draw that bison. 
What does he mean by that? Does he mean he's not talented? No, he was, he taught every class he was in. He was definitely talented. But he understood that, that bison wasn't art for the sake of art. That bison meant so much to the tribals who drew it. That bison meant food, that bison meant God, that bison meant protection, that bison meant danger. That bison maybe meant food for your family for the next few weeks maybe, or your tribe for that matter. He would never be able to draw that bison because he didn't feel that bison. He needed to feel that bison. And I think that's what, that was the spark that lit the man up. That was what triggered his wanderlust. And I think some men and women and people in general can't be constrained to the system. Like he said, civilization is everywhere. But you think New York is the epitome of civilization? Yet we have people on the streets, homeless. Modern civilization is not accommodating. Modern civilization is too structured. Everybody is a cog wheel in the mechanism of the big clock of life, of society. And if you don't belong, you can't fit in. If you're different, you can't fit in. You have to be the right size of gear to fit in your niche in society. And he wasn't. He was an explorer. He wanted to see the world. He wanted to see tribals. He wanted to see people. That's why he studied anthropology. He wanted to understand people, understand society more than the community he came from. He couldn't be constrained. And I think that's what he meant when he said wanderlust. He just didn't want to travel for the sake of travel. He didn't want to travel because he needed a holiday and he didn't want to travel because he needed to be out of his home. He wanted to travel for the experience. He wanted to understand. And a man who loved to understand, obviously loved to explain what he understood. Who wouldn't? In his interaction with the children, his interaction with the young boy, um, yeah, Satyaki, right? In his interaction with Satyaki, interaction with Satyaki's friends, he never let them be happy and content with their answers. They answered his questions, they knew the facts. The moon is closer than the sun. The moon looks bigger because it's closer. The moon is actually smaller than the sun. What the solar eclipse is. They knew it, they knew the facts. They didn't know how to question why. And that's what he tried to teach them. When he said magic, Jamatka, when he said, what did he mean by magic? What did he mean by magic? Why does the moon cover the sun? Magic. He meant that, he meant there is more to life than facts. There is more, there is something supernatural. There is something that ties everything together, which we don't know about, something spiritual. Magic. Magic is science. Magic is understanding. Magic is asking the question, why? Can you find a man with more passion than this? Passion like this doesn't come naturally. A teacher like him doesn't come naturally. They're only born out of experience. I think that's what he wanted to convey to the children, to young Satyaki, that life is more than living. Life is only valuable if you look up, keep your head up, keep your eyes open and experience the world. Ask the question why. I want to talk a little about suspicion now, deviating a bit from the character of Manmohan to the dynamic of the family. Deepankar De as a Suhinda Bose and, um, and Anila. Their suspicion, their 
need to know they need to be sure they need to protect their family and they put, need to protect what they own they need to know they need they suspect i think it's very natural i think all of us would feel this i think all of us would probably do the same thing in their place always the air of suspicion always having to investigate to confirm who this man is there's no trust anymore and he expects this he understands this it's only natural why wouldn't you he probably would have done the same thing in the place and because he had his wits about him because he was one step above above them in every situation because he always had a witty remark it only increased their suspicion maybe it um maybe it you know it quenched their thirst for knowing who he was a bit when he had the answers at hand but it didn't take away the suspicion it only put it aside until the next moment you know until the next time you you had time to yourself where you could overthink and suspect i think this is commentary on society how society moved away from being a civilized community the spirit of togetherness the spirit of hospitality has moved to a spirit of individuality and a nuclear family and i need to protect myself and my own instead of a larger community i think this is what he meant in this by all suspicion in the movie all the mistrust all the needing to know why a person is here needing and there is no more hospitality because that person is in need no it's what is your ulterior motive what is your end goal i think society has moved into i need to be constantly making progress constantly earning money constantly have a motive and nobody could just want to experience that is what how society changed i think that's what they want to show here how everything needs to have an ulterior motive everything needs to be selfish and it need not be that's not how it's supposed to be that's not how society is supposed to be society is supposed to help you grow it's supposed to help individuals grow it's supposed to make everybody content and feel accepted that's what a, a structured society is it's supposed to be inclusionary not ex not to exclude a person who is not typical and i think i will circle back to kupa manduka the frog in the well i think we can tie up the last two parts of our discussion the need for experience and the need for everything to fit in to your structure and your community if not it would be regarded with a sense of suspicion and mistrust that is your well that's your coop and your manduk the frog is the man trapped inside hopping and hopping trying to get out of that well but society is keeping him in the high boundaries the fences around you if you have the strength to do it and even fewer have the courage i think kupa manduka is something so central to the film don't be a frog in the well don't let your horizons be the walls around you don't drown in the rat race of society don't live your life in that small pool without even knowing there's a world around you you think the well is your whole world and the extent of your ability and the extent of your the extent your achievements can take without realizing the ponds and lakes and seas that you can swim in I think when we progress to this particular scene, I think it's important that we sit back and analyze this a bit, because I think this scene is the crux of the whole film. This particular scene is probably what Mr. Ray had in his mind before designing the film around it. I think this is what he wanted to say. This is a social commentary that he wanted to put out by making this film. 
because this film didn't have much of a story. This film didn't have much of a plot line rather. It did, but I think it was more social commentary. And this is central to the film. What is science? What is progress? Is progress the Voyager clicking pictures of Neptune? Is that science? Is that civilization? NASA or NASA? Or is science herbal medicine? Is science an igloo? Is science um, a witch doctor? Is science the pyramids at Machu Picchu? How did one get the stones up the mountains to build a city of stone? How did, the, how did they build the pyramids in Egypt? Is that not science? Science is the small things. Science is the last thing. Science is a small mud hut. Science is modern medicine. It's all science. And it's very wrong of us to pick the side of modern science, you know, pick the side of grandiose satellites in space and spacecrafts and huge cities and metropolises and, um, and fancy new drugs. Science is also the past. Science is also discovery. Science is also civilization. Science, very simply, is a tool for harmony of man, but equally a weapon for disharmony. And I think one of the problems our character faced here, Mr. Manmohan, is that he's not used to social diplomacy. He's not used to weaving his words, to tailoring his sentences, to please people around him. He's not a man to be diplomatic. He's not a man to sweet talk. He's not a man who mince his words. He's a man of passion. He's a man who says what he feels. He's a man living on a different plane of existence. It would be wrong to say existence, living on a different plane of experience. Because when he talks about cannibalism, when he talks about himself, he says, I would rather have been born a savage rather than in your society of Calcutta. This is not something you say to, a, to a, a person you don't know. This is not something you say to people in general, because it, these are topics we avoid. These are topics which are not fit for social conversation. You can't be a cannibal. You can't talk about eating human meat. You can't talk about wanting to eat human meat and saying it may be sweet and tasty. He's, I think this scene was a revelation for Mr. Manohan. He realizes that he doesn't belong in modern civilization. He realizes he doesn't belong in the fast paced life full of facades and diplomacy and having a certain sphere of yourself, which is only in yourself, covered with a facade, which you display to the public. That's not him. He wants, he, he wants to see humans by their souls. He doesn't want to see humans as they portray themselves to him. He's a simpler man. He likes simpler people. Which we can see in this particular scene. All his suspicion were confirmed. He was in it for the money. He was here for the money. Yet, something didn't feel right. They didn't feel manipulated. They didn't feel used. They felt guilty. Even though she says that um, I respect him, but I don't feel kinship with him. 
she doesn't relate to him when he wants to be a savage or wants to consume human meat. He doesn't, she doesn't relate to her uncle. She can't call him mama yet. But the suspicion is gone in this scene. They got their closure. They knew what he was in here for. Yet something didn't feel right. There was no aha moment. This is why he was here. That never came. And I don't think they understood why it never came. They didn't understand why they felt guilty. Until he explains to them, I've got a use to being among simpler people, more homely people, more loving people, people without pretense, people without a facade. He's gotten used to living among tribals and savages, but not savage in the way you and I would think, primitive and so far off from modernity, so lacking. That's not what he saw. He saw strength in their civilization. He saw kinship in their civilization. He saw hospitality and acceptance and love in their civilization, which he, which he found was lacking in the modern civilization. He found it was lacking in their home. He felt more at home with these tribals. He felt more loved with these tribals. He felt more accepted with these tribals than with his own family. I think here we can take a step back and we can reevaluate what is civilization? Is civilization a rat race? Is it just a rat race? Is it just everybody being selfish, doing the best for themselves and their family, trying to reach to the top, trying to survive? Is that society? Is that civilization? Survive? Or is civilization joy, dance, togetherness, kinship, love, acceptance. It's food for thought, right? What is civilization? Is the civilization we live in making us better people? Not even better people. Is the civilization we live in accepting us for who we are? Or is it just waiting for the next cog in the machine? Are we grooming ourselves to be a cog in the machine? Or are we grooming ourselves to ask the question why? Are we grooming ourselves to experience? I think there are two ways to live, as, live life as we can see in this movie. You can live life as part of a larger system. You can live. You can exist or you can experience life. And that is the difference, my friends. That is the difference. Existing and experiencing, growing, understanding, asking why, explaining, sharing your knowledge, sharing whatever you have. Because you're not defined by your bank balance. Because you're going to go away soon. You're just going to be gone. And the next flight out or when you pass. You know what I love about this movie? Is that once they understand this, you can see joy on their faces. This particular scene, you can see her joy, you can see his joy, because there's no more suspicion. There is no more mystery, there's no more, there's no more desire to catch him in the act. No, there's only kinship and love and joy in this scene. And something beautiful in this scene was the director asking us through Mr. Manmohan, why don't you have perspective? Why did you keep thinking like the couple? Why do you always suspect 
the man, why do you always suspect? Mr. Manmohan, you always suspected. When is he going to go up next? What is he going to do next? The suspense is killing me. He never thought about it from his perspective. This was all an experiment for him. This was just another anthropology experiment. This was just another way of him experiencing a new civilization, his family. And when he says that after seeing her dance, with, after seeing her joy at being with simple people, I have now confirmed that she is my niece. We never thought that he also had his doubts whether she was his real niece, that he also had his doubts whether she was family. You can see in his eyes the joy of seeing his blood in her. He can see that wanderlust in her eyes too now. He can see the joy of the simple life, the joy of just being part of community in her eyes. They both can see it. And that's what made them smile. That's what gave them that joy. I think this was very beautiful. This is a beautiful way to close the movie. It didn't close the plot, no, but it perfectly summed up what the director was trying to tell us about civilization, about love, about acceptance, about hospitality, about kinship. What really gives us joy in the end. The joy of a young boy. The look of wonder in his eyes wanting to know more. Look at the fascination, the amusement, the joy in his eyes. Does Mr. Manmohan need much more? Does he need a thank you? Or is the spark he lit in young Satyaki enough? Is thank you enough? That's what he feels. Passing on his experience and his outlook and broadening the young boy's mind is thank you enough for him. The joy is his payment. The joy is his thank you. The movie closes with joy. The movie closes with kinship. The movie closes with her calling him mama, finally, accepting him as part of a family. You can see her, her in that particular scene, acting like the total mother of the family, the homemaker, telling him, no, you don't know how to do it. I am going to do it for you. You men are just haphazard. You can't do, you can't manage yourself. You need me. I am the homemaker here. I'm going to arrange your suitcase. I'm making sure you don't have to take an extra bag. It just shows acceptance of him into the family. It shows joy of having a family member there. When Deepankar, they hugged Utpal in that particular scene, when Mr. Bose and Mr. Mitra shared that embrace, it was an embrace of understanding. They dispensed with the touching of feet because that was unnecessary and practically meaningless because they both understood that's not what civilization meant. But the embrace of pure joy meant more to him than any respect he could have gotten from having his feet touched. And Mr. Bose knew that that joy he received from the embrace was more blessing than he would ever get from touching his feet the joy of finally understanding and experiencing the joy of broadening your horizon. And finally, flossy nasi nihil pilip vacation. Perfect way to close the film. All your little things like money, they didn't mean anything to me. I didn't come here for this. 
these small things, the will, the money, the somebody robbing something from your house, it meant nothing to him. He was here for the joy. He was here for the experience. He was here for his family. Frosty, nasty, nihili, pilification. Bye. <laughs>